Thank you very much, Lord Turner. And I would now invite the uh, other members of the panel up on the stage, and I'll introduce you as you're heading up here. Uh, Frank Westhoff uh, from DZ Bank, from the Vorstand of DZ Bank. Andreas Dombret from the Bundesbank, where his duties include being in charge of bank supervision. And um, Mr. Um, Jens Tolkmet from the Association of German Fund Brief Banks, which are the uh, banks that issue covered bonds. Uh, but he was telling me before the conference he'd like to, uh, before the panel, that he'd like to speak about banks in general. So we have a good panel. And I think, uh, why don't I start with a yes or no question, just to kind of get everybody to take sides. And um, let me come off what you were just talking about, Lord Turner, on QE. Um, if you look at QE, we all know QE has positives and negatives. When you put it on balance, you see QE as a positive, more positive for the European economy than negative. Just yes or no. Let me start with you, Jens. More negative. More negative. More positive, positive, better than nothing. Uh, <laughs> That's too long. That's too dangerous, too long. but better than nothing. So yes. <laughs> yes. Frank, yes. OK, good. All right. Well, Frank, let me start with you then, because I'm surprised to hear you say that, because usually uh, Almost every German banker that you talk to, not to deal too much in stereotypes, but almost every German banker says that quantitative easing is a bad thing. So why do you see it as a good thing? Well, or, um, More good than bad. Well, more good than bad. That's, that's the right expression on this. Well, in some countries, quantitative easing can help to solve the problem in supplying the economy with uh, loans and enabling investments for real uh, economy. But what quantitative easing cannot do is replace economic reforms that are necessary. So as Morturner said, better than nothing. OK. Uh, Andreas, you're representing the Bundesbank. I know that the Bundesbank has a very strong position on, on QE. Now that it's been going on for a week, maybe you can sort of give us your view on what effect it's actually having in the banking system. Yeah, first of all, I have to say thank you for inviting me. Secondly, I have to say these yes or no questions are really bad. Uh, you know, uh, I suffer because, uh, it, you know, one shouldn't be forced to do uh, this sort of uh, um, uh, short answers. This, this is the format that you are I know the format, and I, you know, but it's, it doesn't give justice um, uh, really to, to, to the That'll be the uh, last the yes or no of question. The, of the question. Now, um, The main reason for us to have QE is uh, to fight deflationary tendencies. Um, I am not sure that uh, we have enough evidence that um, we are close to deflationary tendencies. Actually, uh, many international institutions argue that we are not, and I fully agree with that. So. Um, uh, we have evidence of uh, you know, very low inflation rates. That's, there's no doubt in my mind. Um, but this should not be a very long-lived phenomenon. It should be rather short-lived and wash out over time. Now, um, QE also, you know, and Anshu um, answered that a little bit, uh, Anshu Jane, always a QE is not a normal monetary policy measure. You can only do a certain amount of QEs, and um, um, they always do have side effects. But let me end by saying that this is a majority decision of the governing council of the ECB, and the Bundesbank will support quantitative easing with uh, all our means. There is no doubt in my mind that we will be acquiring um, over the next 19 months, I guess, 190 billion euros worth of um, German government bonds and German government agencies. And Jens, you're sort of an interesting Should position. Should it last, last so long? You're in sort of an interesting position because actually one of the first bonds that the ECB started buying way back when the crisis started was covered bonds. And that's also, it's not talked about as much, but that's also part of the QE program. But you still said that you think QE is more negative than positive. Yeah, I, I, think, <clears throat> I think if you look at the banking side, you can, you can clearly see if you compare the three covered bond purchase programs over time, um, you can clearly differentiate between those that made sense 
and those that might not make as lot sense as, as it, was, it was perceived to be. And if you look at the first one, it was vital in restarting the cover bond market, so restarting the funding for many banks that, that refinance themselves uh, on, on a wholesale basis uh, in capital markets and did not have any other opportunity to do so. Second one wasn't necessary either. Um, so um, they, the, the, the central bank stopped short. Instead of buying the announced 40 billion euros, they only bought 16 billion euros. And this is even more true for the third one, um, which, which is now underway and which, which, is, which is very strong program indeed. Um, and, and we are wondering, what does it help in terms of, and that is the, and I think that is, that is maybe one of the reasons why we are against this and why we are critical about it. Um, what, what does it help banks that are already over liquid to get more liquidity um, through such a program and through central bank uh, loose monetary policy? Um, uh, does, it, does it help the real economy? Does it transmit into the real economy in terms of lower rates? I don't think so. Liquidity is not the problem of banks in lending to, to companies. It's the demand of companies do they want to lend, actually, and I would, I would question that. And I think from a, capital, for, from a bank point of view, it's, it's a capital issue. They, they are still underway building up the capital requirements that they are, they are required to hold uh, from 2018 onwards. They are still under pressure, as was said before as well, uh, of different regulatory initiatives that have to be labored into, into your system as a bank. And I think that is the real challenge. And the final thing is that uh, once the crisis had started, uh, banks um, returned to a way of, it's at least my perception, of pricing risk appropriately, uh, other than before the crisis. And that is also hindering them from just moving on and, and pushing on all the low rates and the liquidity that they get from the central bank into the real economy. And if you, if you have that analysis, then providing an over-liquid system with more liquidity doesn't really help. Okay, well, maybe the, the core question, which we also discussed with Andrew Jane, is, I mean, what's, what's holding up the, the lending process? I mean, is it the banks need to be fixed more? And Andreas, maybe I'll ask you, because uh, you were very involved in the comprehensive assessment. You know very much what's going on inside German banks and European banks in general. Where are we in the sort of continuum where we're going to see a turnaround, where the banks are going to feel confident about lending again, um, and where this capital won't be as, as big a concern? We are in a much better place than we were uh, before this assessment. And I do really think that the, um, uh, that the assessment and this uh, clean of health check is helping banks trust each other much more. And it's also helping investors <laughs> having more transparency um, about the banking sector and being able to trust banks more. Now, we are in a complex world where Germany is not on its own and uh, we have challenges um, in the euro area. And many, many um, investors and market participants are waiting for the structural reforms of the economies to happen in order to see light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, it is not necessarily always uh, the central banks and monetary policy which should solve every issue. It is first and foremost the political scene doing those structural reforms where it's needed. And that's what investors and market participants are waiting for. Go ahead, Jens. I would just like to, <clears throat> to add with regard to where are we um, measured from the point where, where lending gets restarted. I think um, it, it was already said that we are, yes, we are closer to the point than ever before. Um, my feeling is, and I tried to say that in my last answer, that the decisive point is once all the regulatory initiatives have been implemented in banks or are in the way of it being implemented, including the, the, the change of supervision to ECB, once that has happened um, and once these regulatory issues are out of the way, this will help uh, get lending restarted. And what about other types of financing? This was again something that Andrew Jane raised, uh, capital markets. And it's well known that uh, European companies do not draw on capital markets the same way that American companies do. Would that be a solution? It seems like it solves some of the capital problems, um, some of the funding problems, risk problems for uh, the peripheral countries. Why isn't that happening and what, what could make it happen in Europe, Lord Turner? I think it's very important for us to understand clearly what the comparison of US versus uh, Europe tells us, and I think it's sometimes misinterpreted. 
It is true that Europe, let's say, order of magnitude, lend income 70% from the banking system, 30 from capital markets, US the other way around. And people then sometimes leap to the conclusion, ah oh, yes, the US has a whole load of SMEs which are funded by capital markets. The figures don't support that at all. Securitization and capital markets play a trivial role in the debt funding of SMEs everywhere in the world. If you look at US securitization, it is essentially two things. Uh, the, the difference between Europe is d d explained by two things. One of which is a somewhat higher role of corporate bonds versus bank lending to major corporates, but I've never heard anybody in Europe say that major corporates are so short of finance. And the other, by far the bigger, is that the US has a retail mortgage-backed securities market. It securitizes its residential mortgages fundamentally because of an enormous set of uh, state interventions through the role of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So it is simply not true that the US has a bigger role for securitization in SMEs. What may be the case is that because the US banking system doesn't do so much residential mortgages, it concentrates more on SMEs, whereas in Europe there is a diversion of attention into the mortgage business. But I do think just in all of these debates about the capital markets union, we have to start with some facts, and I would encourage you to look at the facts of the US securitization market. When I last look at it, of all US credit securities, no more than about 4% have anything to do with the SME market. Frank, I'd well, be interested in your views on that. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I would like to come back to the former point regarding quantitative easing, uh, as already said. I said it is primi primarily positive. Um, and it's important to say that we don't have, do not have to look through the German glasses. Uh, Europe is not uh, the same everywhere. In Germany, uh, it's right to say, maybe it's right to say there's no necessity of quantitative easing. Uh, it might be another case in Spain, in Italy, or in Portugal, uh, because there we can buy at least time through this quantitative easing. Uh, but uh, very important is that structures has to be uh, brought on the way and finalized in order to, uh, to, uh, to use the time that was given us by the ECB. That's very, very important. Uh, the second point, the capital markets. Well, uh, what is wrong with the European system of 60 or 70 percent bank lending? What has been wrong in the last decades or centuries, one can say? Uh, Europe developed very well. I think it's a question of historical development of capital markets. And there are some differences between the Anglo-Saxon way and the European way. However, it functioned very well uh, in the last uh, decades. And uh, here again, let me, uh, in this case, let me consider it through the German glasses. In, in German, you have no problem uh, with the banking market. You have no problem with liquidity. There's no need to foster capital markets in order to, uh, in order to uh, bring more money and more debt to the small and medium-sized enterprises. We have enough money here. And why is this effect? Because the creditworthiness of uh, most debtors are uh, high enough in order to encourage banks to lend money. Uh, it might be different in, well, let's say Italy, or uh, let me take Greece. There's, there's a lack of trust. No one is going there to Greece to lend money to SMEs. Why? Again, structural reforms and trust is lagging. If you solve this problem, you will solve the other problem too. That's not, that's not the task uh, of monetary policy or of banks. That's the task of the politicians in the end. Did you want to respond to, respond to that, Lord Turner? I, I just wanted to add to that. I mean, I, I think, I, I tend to agree that I think we may be pursuing a sort of false premise if we believe that through a capital markets union we are going to solve some problem of SME finance, which is, you know, across Europe holding back uh, business. I think there are separate issues on uh, capital markets union on the equity side, things like venture capital, right, which I think is more important than the bank lending side. But I think if I could just return to my point that the 
distinctive feature of the US, the reason why it's 70-30 versus us 30-70, is the retail mortgage-backed securities market. I think we then have to understand that that both has an advantage and a disadvantage. And the disadvantage was clear before the crisis, and the advantage has been seen since it. The disadvantage before the crisis is that that securitized system of retail mortgage provision was actually worse for credit underwriting quality than the European bank mortgage system. Uh, in even the worst countries like Spain and Ireland, the bank losses from bad mortgages have been nothing like as bad as those generated uh, in the US uh, uh, securitized system, where basically there were a whole number of people along these distribution chains who couldn't give a damn about uh, the quality of the mortgages they were originating as long as they could dump them on the next person along the chain uh, before they went bad. So that was a disadvantage. I mean, let's be clear, that, that securitization system, and it played a very major role in the origins of the crisis. I mean, the, 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 the immediate start point of this crisis had a hell of a lot to do with the US securitized mortgage system. I think post the crisis, and this is why it is relevant to the QE debate, and Anshu Jain, I think, made the point earlier, it has given a point of intervention for the Federal Reserve, which is lacking in Europe. And this may be why, although I said, you know, QE in Europe is better than nothing, it may be less effective than in the US, because it has been undoubtedly the case that if you try to work out the transmission mechanism of QE to the real economy in the US, it has been through the retail mortgage-backed security market, through the reduction, therefore, of the mortgage refinancing rates which are available to ordinary uh, American householders, and through the re-stimulus to uh, the US uh, housing market. And that transmission mechanism you know, is really not available uh, to the ECB. It's just, it's just not part uh, of our system. And I think, therefore, as a post-crisis uh, response mechanism, there has been an advantage, but I also make the point that before the crisis, um, this securitized system produced worse credit underwriting, I think, than anywhere in Europe. Um, you mentioned, a, you reminded me of a topic that I wanted to cover that came up this morning, venture capital. Uh, and if you look at the uh, World Economic Forum surveys, the World Bank surveys, Germany, Europe in general ranks very poorly, almost embarrassingly poor in conditions for start startups. And part of that is, is venture capital. What needs to be done to make more venture capital, capital available in Europe? And Andreas. It is, we are lagging so much behind that that would be a long list. But let me start by the most uh, obvious um, uh, two issues. The first is, that, of course, uh, banks are hesitating to give venture capital for all the regulatory reasons. Secondly, um, as you know, um, our tax system is favoring debt over equity because you can use uh, the debt write-downs and uh, there is a bias towards debt, which is, of course, not helping any form of equity, including uh, venture capital, which does it makes it hard. Um, uh, the banks on the one side, the tax regime on the other, to get where you would like to go in Germany. Mm -hmm. Jens, would you, would you like to answer the question about? Oh. Yeah, okay. Frank, uh, well, water. <laughs> well, it's a difficult question. As Dr. Domret already said, uh, banks are a little bit hesitant uh, to lend money to, uh, well, to, to customers. Uh, in which they have some, well, some reluctances regarding the creditworthiness. Uh, unproved products, unproved business models. So that's, that's not the job of the bank. The bank, the job of the bank is normally in the credit side, uh, well, to, to evaluate and assess the business models, products, and the financial statements uh, of your customers, and then to lend or not to lend. But uh, the core ability of a bank is not uh, to be an entrepreneur who puts uh, money in maybe very successful business models in the future. Therefore, we have this so-named uh, venture capital. But again, that's not a task of the banks. In this case, I must revise my opinion regarding capital markets. For, for this specific niche, capital markets or funds, equity funds, whatever, are of utmost importance. 
but I, I don't know if anybody, Lord Turner, wants to answer the question, why don't we have that in, in Europe? The, the answer is do? I don't know. Okay. Uh, but but <laughs> Very clear. I, I, I think of all the agenda which Jonathan Hill set out earlier, that's the one which really needs a strong focus and a think through. Is it something to do with tax? Is it something to do with institutional structures? I mean, at one level, it, you know, it's not clear what the fundamental difference is uh, there uh, versus the US. I mean, Andreas is quite right to say that across the world we have a tax problem of our bias towards debt, not equity, but there's a tax bias uh, within the US uh, corporate tax system as, as well as uh, in the European towards uh, a debt rather than equity. So it's not clearly uh, a difference. Um, I suspect that there are these very subtle things. I was very struck uh, by the comments Peter Preit made before lunch about how deeply embedded in very subtle cultural things some aspects of our economic performance are and that they are relatively unamenable to one or two sort of silver bullet bits of, a, uh, of public policy. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And therefore, I think within the whole capital markets agenda, the issue of the venture capital markets, the ease of uh, floating on small cap uh, uh, markets, the issue about how you create liquidity, how you create enough small cap equity market activity that it's then worthwhile for people to research it and follow it. Uh, the role of insurance companies and pension companies in being willing to put some money at risk in the venture capital space. Uh, I think that requires you know, a lot of thought and is probably, there's probably more mileage uh, in that uh, than in any dream uh, that we're gonna be taking SME loans and packaging them up and turn them into uh, pooled securities. I, I once asked a venture capitalist that question, why they, they don't invest in Europe, and he said it was very simple, because you don't have an exit, you don't have a stock market that will, uh, equivalent to NASDAQ, that can handle those startup companies. We do have a stock market. Uh, let me yeah, well, that. I guess it's, it's not as, not as, Make that very clear. <laughs> not as liquid, not as uh, risk-taking, yes. Well, and Mr. Ewing, yes. uh, may, I, may I run you back uh, some, well, let's say uh, 15 years or so. Uh, in Germany, we have the so-named new market. Right, I remember that, yes. We, have a, we, have a, we had a very, very big rally. Mm -hmm. um, however, some of these business models didn't work. And right. therefore, uh, many investors are reluctant to invest again in such business models, at but, least in but, Germany. But that is the whole point of venture capital. If you look at all the venture capital houses on the West Coast, broadly speaking, they're successful because they backed 10 things and eight were disasters, yes. one was okay, and one was a superstar. That, that, that's just the nature of what venture capital is. So, you know, if we have a sort of culture which walks away, and you know, and NASDAQ itself, as we know, you know, went from 1,500 to 5,000 back to 1,500 in the course of five years. A lot of businesses went bankrupt, but it still left us with Google and Yahoo and Amazon. So, you know, that is part of the, as it were, creative destruction of, of, of capitalism. Mm -hmm. and, no well, German, and no German company, let's say in the pharmaceutical space or wherever, um, would be hindered by anybody in Germany to list at Nasdaq. Yeah, should they true. ever want it so. So uh, I think there are some bankers in the room who would help them do that mm -hmm. uh, against the fee. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, uh, that is uh, absolutely possible. You don't have to list in Germany just because you are a German venture capitalist. Yeah? It's a, there's no rule for that. Mm -hmm. Well, and to add one point, uh, our bank has a, uh, has a subsidiary too, which uh, is active uh, in, uh, in equities and financing new and SME companies. However, uh, from a stock market perspective, it doesn't help you as an investor if somebody tells you, well, eight or nine goes bankrupt and the one succeed <laughs> if you are invested in, uh, in all, of ten, all 10 of them. Um, let's turn to the single supervisory mechanism, the other big, big change in the last six months. And I'm gonna start with you, Andreas, because you were very, very deeply involved in it. I'm a member. But, <laughs> right, exactly, you're on the board. <laughs> You oversaw the comprehensive assessment in Germany. Uh, there's probably nobody who's more deeply involved in it than you, except maybe Daniel and Louise. Um, but how's it working so far? I mean, it started in October officially. November, for, for what, what, mm -hmm. if, what have you learned so far? Where do you see it going from here? You know, this is a, um, not only a new entity, it's also a process. 
how you think about things and how you mm -hmm. uh, go about things, which was put together in a vo very short period of time. If you compare it to other projects of this size, this was speeding, uh, you know, and many things were done while um, uh, forming the single supervisory mechanism. And uh, so you need some patience. Let me start out by saying one needs some patience and one needs to give uh, the SSM a little bit of time in order to get where we want to go. Having said that, though, the, um, uh, the, the stress test and the quantitative assessment should help us um, if we did a good enough job and if we knew everything um, um, which is to be known to have some time within the SSM um, before um, you know, major accident, accidents will start because we have seen uh, many of the issues and we have addressed those issues and equity has been built up. So uh, whilst we did it very quickly, we also should have some time and now we have to practice how we work together. There are uh, a lot of written procedures, a lot of things which need to be decided. The uh, structure is not, um, how do you say, is uh, quite complex, I should say. I was looking for the other, for the opposite. Is quite complex and we have to involve, and we always do, the governing council. So this is not an easy task to do, but you need to give it some time uh, to get this to work. Up to now, uh, we are working very well together. Don't forget that the leadership of the SSM, starting with Daniel Nui and including Sabine Lautenschläger and also the Director Generals, are first class, first class, A class, A team colleagues, and uh, that should also help uh, in uh, achieving the goal. So I am optimistic from, from, from now, but in, e in every new institution, you will have an accident at some point, and then I would like to remind you of what I said at the beginning, patience would help a little bit mm -hmm. in that regard. Jens, how does it look from the banking industry point of view? I think, I think quite similar. Um, the, f the first few months, although there has been a lot of um, serious thought about how would that work out, have been very good. There is a good cooperation between the regulator, um, the ECB also, and, and the banks. And, and what I hear is that the, that the discussions are very fruitful. I think um, the, the main challenge going forward is that especially if you look at the German system, German banking system, and if you look at the banks that are under the ECB uh, uh, supervision now, um, you have quite a diverse structure of banks. And the, the, one of the main challenges, in my view, will be how to accommodate all those different business models, how to accommodate the different sizes of the banks. Yeah? Basically, you can say that in Germany, um, there are a number of banks that, that basically qualified for the 30 billion uh, cutoff uh, balance sheet uh, uh, volume and are therefore under ECB supervision, but they are in many cases, and that is due to their specific business model, they are, they are medium-sized enterprises with a very lean organization, and that, that now is confronted with a, with a huge organization, and I think you have to, f to find ways, as we did in Germany, but it was established, you have to find ways how to accommodate different business models, different sizes of banks, and uh, give them the supervision they need, but maybe not more. And uh, to make a concrete example, Deutsche Bank is a different, uh, different uh, uh, institution than is uh, Hamburgische Sparkasse in, uh, in I Hamburg. I can confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <coughs> Lord Turner, former top regulator in Britain, how do you assess the European effort so far? Well, I think the SSM is a very, very important step in a process of essentially federalizing, moving to the federal level, by which I mean the Eurozone level, a set of functions which have to be at the Eurozone level in order for the Eurozone to be a successful uh, currency union. I think, however, there are others as well which are related to it. The debates about the SSM really got going about uh, four years ago I guess, back in 2011 or so, when we were all worried, for instance, in the early debates of the European Systemic Risk Board about the, the loop between sovereign solvency and bank solvency. Uh, we had very high spreads on um, Spanish bonds, Italian bonds. Uh, those were then raising questions about the uh, creditworthiness of um, you know, 
Spanish banks or Italian banks, their solvency. Uh, but then when you ask, well, okay, what if they get into trouble? Uh, who's going to look after them? Uh, the answer is we were the Spanish state and the Italian state. You say, but hang on, the Spanish state and the Italian state, we were already worried about how much debt they've got. We had this sort of doom loop between sovereign and bank solvency. And the SSM is part of the solution to that. It's part of saying, look, at the very least, we want to make sure that we don't have a whole load of Spanish caixa, which are full of you know, very poor commercial real estate lending, as they were. We want some standard, which is common. But there are other things I think we need to do as well to make the Eurozone a successful single <coughs> currency and single banking market. And the way I'd put it is like this. If in the US you said, well, this is how we're going to organize the banking system. Major banks in Illinois or California are going to own as their undoubted liquid asset undiversified portfolios of Illinois or California state bonds. If they get into trouble, the depositors are going to be looked after by the Illinois or the California state insurance scheme. And if we need to rescue them to keep lending going to the Californian or the Illinois economy, they're going to be bailed out by the Illinois or California state. The moment you wrote that down, anybody would say, you are mad as a hatter. This is complete lunacy. You could not have designed a system better designed to create wrong way correlated risk. Because when the economy of Illinois turns down and the tax revenues of Illinois state turns down, the Illinois banks will have bad lane losses. You know, everything is correlated, which is why in the Eurozone, in the US currency system, the liquid assets of the banks are not state and muni bonds. They are UST bonds. The deposit insurance scheme, scheme is called the Federal Deposit Insurance Scheme. And if despite all our attempts to get rid of too big to fail, there still needs to be a bank bailout, the bank bailout will occur at federal US level. Now, if you do that, you've then got to have federal level supervision because you can't ask a German taxpayer or a German deposit insurance scheme to take any responsibility for a Spanish bank unless it feels, unless he or she feels that they've got an institution looking after their interests. But to me, therefore, the SSM was also always, therefore, a necessary step but not sufficient within a wider package, and I think we still haven't gone the distances required to make uh, the Eurozone uh, a stable single banking market and a stable and sustainable currency union. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the, the doom loop, which was this connection, toxic connection between banks and sovereign bonds. It was just an ECB report looking at what, if anything, should be done about that. And I'm interested in what the panelists here think. Should the supervisors be pushing the banks, and I think this is a Europe-wide question, not just a German question, should they be pushing the banks to get rid of their sovereign bonds? Should they put it, be putting a, a risk weight on sovereign bonds so that there isn't the incentive uh, to expose yourself so much to your own government? But what about you, Jens? I think um, what, what we have seen in, in regulation recently points in the directly different direction. So um, if, you look at, if you look at risk weighting, indeed, yeah, we are strongly in favor of, of establishing uh, different risk weights for, for governments instead of what I see as a certain kind of placebo um, to do the same thing, uh, introducing a leverage ratio, because you would assess risk properly and then, and then uh, also price it uh, properly um, if, if you buy something like that. So if, if you look at risk weights, also if you look at certain, at certain um, um, regulatory details, like for example LCR or, or the question what, what bonds can insurance companies buy without having any, any risk weight, uh, the only ones by the way, it's always uh, government bonds. And I'm not sure whether this is the right signal to actually de-link uh, government debt and the situation of a government of a sovereign from, from the banking sector. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what I want to say is we are, I think we are moving far away uh, instead of instead of solving that problem mm -hmm. by recent regulation. 
Um, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, the format now calls for me to give you, if, Andreas, if you liked the yes and no questions, you're really going to love this. Um, I'm going to give a, the first part of a sentence, and it's your job to complete it. And, and this is not a yes and no. You are allowed to elaborate a little bit. So let me throw this out. Very simple, broad question. The best way to get banks to lend more to businesses and consumers in the Eurozone would be to blank. Frank, do you want to? Well, relatively easy. Stable environment, positive economic outlook, and a prudent supervision. Add a coordinated fiscal stimulus to the monetary stimulus. Andreas? Uh, complete, as I said, the uh, structural reforms in order to put the monetary union on a solid footing, footing and uh, have sustainable growth in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Reduce um, regulatory activity for a while and sit back and assess what you've done so far and whether it's enough and in which way it should be modified to, to, to fit the financial system and make it powerful. Very good. Okay, with that, I think we should close. And thank you very much to all our panelists. And